Even though the fatal reactions are rare, I learn about one per month. And it's very sad. Every one of those stories comes with a tragedy that's heart-wrenching. But it compels me to keep training my patients on making sure they have two injectable epinephrine devices at all times, making sure they know how to use it within a minute, making sure that if it doesn't help their symptoms within a minute, that they use another right away, that it's okay to use an injectable epinephrine device because that's the only thing that can actually prevent the unfortunate death. It would pr maybe be a good idea to differentiate between a food sensitivity and an allergy. Is that the right terminology that you would use? Yeah, that's excellent. So food sensitivity means that you can bite a food and you're typically going to react to a chemical in that food, perhaps a protein, but it's mostly a small molecule, maybe a sugar, maybe a fat, maybe a spice. Uh, and with that, people can get headaches, people can get bloating. Typical food sensitivity is like lactose intolerance. When you drink milk, for example, one of the sugars in the milk is called lactose. And if you don't have an enzyme in your gut and in your body called lactase, you can't break down that sugar. And so that's why people take lactate milk, for example. Um, and there are some ethnicities that don't have that enzyme. So there is a bunch of people that in a certain population really can't drink cow's milk because of that lactose sugar. So that's a food sensitivity. People get bloating, people get headaches, but they're not going to have a fatal reaction. Highly unlikely. And, and just to be clear, Carrie, the immune system is not reacting at all in that state of a food sensitivity. Ah, great question. It can react. When you have enough lactose and you keep drinking lactose and your body says, I don't like this sugar, why are you keep giving me the sugar when I, when I can't break it down? What happens is it sends its immune cells to try to break it down and that causes inflammation. So some people, when they take uh, certain, uh, and preservatives as well, certain emulsifiers, these chemicals, they can get into the body and our immune system doesn't like it because it's foreign. A lot of our preservatives and unfortunate emulsifiers that hasn't been seen by the body before, it's not something that's natural. So for some people, their immune system does react, but it reacts with a different pathway than an allergic pathway. It reacts with sometimes immunoglobulins, IgGs. It reacts with something called a cytokine that isn't great because it causes chronic inflammation. So we do have some chemicals that are associated with food sensitivities that can activate the immune system in a way that's not great for the human body. And so that's why if someone does have bloating or headaches or they can still have rashes for food sensitivity, you can still have rashes in your skin with certain chemicals that you eat in foods. And if that's happening to you, then get yourself tested because we want to make sure it's not a food allergy. But importantly, as we don't have cures or therapy for food sensitivities, we often will tell people, please avoid that food. Like I have someone that has terrible bloating with mushrooms because it's a certain chemical in the mushroom that bothers her immune system. Why? I don't know. But the minute she even smells the mushroom, she gets this immediate reaction to her gut that causes her to vomit, but it's not a food allergy. It's an intense reaction of the nervous system to that food chemical. You know, sometimes we see people who have kind of a low grade elevation of their C-reactive protein. Again, we really like to see the very sensitive version of that below one. And so you, you'll you see these people that otherwise seem reasonable, but their C-reactive protein is somewhere between two and three. So it's two to three times higher than it should be. And it lingers in this state for a very long period of time. There's no, clearly no infection that's been brewing for that long. You query them a little bit more and you sort of realize that it might be attributed to food. And, and, and I would say in my experience, the two foods that far and away account for the majority of this are first uh, wheat related products and secondly dairy. When I say wheat, I don't mean celiac disease, which I'd like you to explain as a contrast, but rather some sort of low grade sensitivity. And so what you're saying is there's nothing going on in the IgE pathway, but there is something going on in the IgG pathway. And again, C-reactive protein is made by the liver as basically a calling sign to the immune system. You're seeing the sirens going constantly, which is CRP. Great analogy. And, and Peter, it's an excellent question because we can measure what we can measure. And CRP has been around in our 
sort of doctor's handbag for a while. And it's actually a really good beacon, like you analog analogized, because it does tell us something's going on there. And it is kind of a window into what's going on chronically in the immune system. So yes, when I test the CRP levels in my patients with food sensitivities, and they're not able to eliminate that specific chemical, then I see the CRP kind of in, in that kind of range where it's, a, I call it simmering immune inflammation. It's not a fire, but it's simmering. And the problem with food sensitivities is I don't have a great way to diagnose them. I don't have a skin test. I don't have an mm -hmm. IgE test. I have to do elimination and then I follow that CRP level until it can try to get to zero. But that's not easy because some of these chemicals are so systematically in our food supply that it's hard to get rid of. So that's food sensitivity. And I agree with you, milk and wheat are some of the most associated culprits in food sensitivities, especially in the US. And that might be for a lot of different reasons in terms of how we process and how we have detergents in our milk and the same thing with our wheat products. It isn't necessarily the same wheat that we ate when we were when our ancestors yep. ate it originally. So maybe there's a lot of reasons for that. But let me bring it to wheat because this triangulation of food sensitivity, celiac versus food allergy, and we'll get to food allergy. But let me just transpose this interesting comment you made about food sensitivity versus celiac. So celiac is a very specific type of food sensitivity, and it has a very marched out pathway of immune reaction to that wheat. And that wheat protein, and specifically, is the gliadin, which is a part of the wheat. And celiac disease also has genetics associated with it and other autoimmune disease with it, as you know. But that reaction is to a very specific part of the protein of the wheat, and not everyone with a food sensitivity to wheat has celiac, and certainly not everyone with celiac will have the same type of reactions to wheat as the food sensitivity people do. Now, celiac we take extremely seriously because it can result in long-term problems with your gut. And so it has its own special category, but you shouldn't call yourself someone that has celiac just because you have a food sensitivity to wheat. There's a specific diagnosis that needs to occur with a professional that specializes in gastroenterology or in celiac to be able to know if I truly have celiac disease. And if you do, then it's important to test family members and to really get under the care of a good doctor. And I hope that that's helpful to differentiate food sensitivity to yep. celiac. Are there any other questions you have on that? Are we seeing any increase in the prevalence of celiac disease or are we seeing any increase in the prevalence of food sensitivities? It certainly seems like it as a non-epidemiologist who pays attention only to the world around him, but it seems like more and more people are saying, uh, boy, I'm really struggling to eat fill in the blank. On one side, I think that people are becoming more knowledgeable about this and they also feel they have agency as they should when they come to the doctor to be able to say, I think I have a sensitivity to this food. And, and people take them seriously and that's good. And we need that because these symptoms are serious. They're affecting someone's quality of life. We need to help. And in the past, maybe they were kind of poo-pooed and said, oh, I can't help you, so I can't do anything about that. But now people like you and I can say, well, let's test that CRP. Let's see if we can do be better detectives and really try to help you. Because in the end, we want to help quality of life. So yes, people I think are feeling more and more like they can talk about it as well as celiac disease. But importantly is we have better diagnostics. So I think that we as a community have gotten better at really uh, diagnosing celiac. So I think that's another good reason why there might be more people with it. I think people also are seeing an increase in food sensitivities in celiac because of the different ways that wheat is processed, uh, because of the different detergents now and unfortunate chemicals that are put into our foods. So I think we have to be careful about that. And hopefully the food industry and agriculture will think carefully about those chemicals before they put them in, because I've seen an increase. And when I tell people to not eat foods with those chemicals in them, they tend to not have 
food sensitivities. So I, I think that perhaps, and I'd be interested in your comment too, Peter, that might be one of the reasons why there's more food sensitivity, although I don't I can't put my finger on it. I, I feel like there's something going on, and, and I know we're going to talk about this also on the food allergy side, where I think we can probably speak with more clarity. So, so let's now let's now talk about that. Let's just start with some statistics. Uh, do you have a sense of how many people in the United States die as a result of a food allergy? Thankfully, it is extremely rare. The reason why I hedge is because nowadays, with the codes and the emergency rooms and understanding if someone died from a food allergy. Some emergency rooms, some intensive care units, they're able to ascribe or attribute a certain reaction exactly to a food. Sometimes it's a little blurry. One of the reasons why people can have a fatal attack is because they don't have access to an epi uh, device or they don't have anticipatory guidance for what to do during a reaction. So any, in my mind, any fatal reaction could have been avoided. And that's yeah. what I learned from that case, is even though the fatal reactions are rare, they can be avoided. And when we learn about them, and I learn about one per month, right, in, in the US, and it's very sad, every one of those stories comes with um, a tragedy that's heart-wrenching. But it compels me to keep training my patients on making sure they have two injectable epinephrine devices at all times, making sure they know how to use it within a minute, making sure that if it doesn't help their symptoms within a minute, that they use another right away, that it's okay to use an injectable epinephrine device because that's the only thing that can actually prevent the unfortunate death. And so I think the numbers right now in terms of death rates are getting lower, which is good because people are understanding more about this disease and the communities understand that why we don't want to expose people unnecessarily to foods that could kill them. But in addition, there are increasing incidence and prevalence of food allergies in general in the U.S. So for example, my colleague Ruchi Gupta out of Chicago, she published data that one in every 12 children in the classroom in the U.S. has a doctor's diagnosis of food allergy. And we used to think that children would lose their food allergy, especially those with milk and egg. So it used to be thought, even when I was training, that children with milk and egg allergies, if they were under the age of five, there was like an 80% chance that they would lose these allergies by the time they were teenagers. But if it was peanut or, or any kind of tree nut or shrimp or fish, they had an 80% chance of keeping it. But now, unfortunately, if you have a milk or an egg allergy and you're under the age of five, you have a 50% chance of losing it. So now we see more and more adults having food allergy. And the other unfortunate thing, Peter, is that more adults, when they get to adulthood, are getting food allergies. And so that's presumably about one in 30 adults will have some type of food allergy when they're an adult, whether or not that's because they had it when they were children or because they gain it newly when they're an adult. So the numbers are rising. Luckily, the death numbers are not, but someone needs to do more research on that. This compels me as a food allergist to really make sure that both children and adults understand this disease and how to manage it. Mm -hmm.